I believe it is a good thing that the world pays attention to Jesus Christ for whatever reason. For whatever reason. Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 18, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed and in this I rejoice. So I make no apologies when I say amen because the world for some reason pays attention to Jesus Christ. For some reason, hears the gospel. For some reason, sees the cross. For some reason, hears the story of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I make no excuses for that. I am happy, happy about that because there's so much attention focused away from things that are holy and noble and high and pure and right and just and every day we are inundated with it. And so for one moment, when there is a ray of light in this world, like Paul, I rejoice. And I pray that you rejoice as well. So on this day, when the world is focusing on the resurrection of Jesus, which I said is a good thing, let us therefore review this central event in our faith. We've certainly sung about it and those Psalms spoke of it. Let's examine what the resurrection of Jesus was pointing towards. It was not an event that happened in a vacuum, it, you know, to show that God could do it. It did not just happen for its own sake. It happened so that something else could happen. The resurrection of Jesus pointed to the eventual resurrection of every single believer. That's the point. That Jesus rose from the dead is a marvelous thing. It's a miracle. It's a, it's a miracle that has no meaning to me if it's not attached to, to my own resurrection in some way. And so I'm not ashamed to stand here before you this evening and say that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, not only because he is good and pure and without sin, not only because he is God and God Almighty, not only because he offers me forgiveness, which I need every single day, I follow Jesus most of all because I want to live after I die. And no one else has ever promised this to any of their uh, disciples. Because more than ever, I am reminded as I get older that death is true. It is not something that is meant for someone else, but it's also meant for me. The recent deaths of not only longtime members of this congregation, but also of a close family member back in Montreal recently, these deaths have reminded me that I too am going to die just as all of us here tonight will suffer this very end without exception. And so the important thing about the resurrection as I acknowledge it with you this day is a reminder that not only that Jesus rose from the dead, but that I also am going to raise from the dead one day as will you. So let's talk about that. Because Marty this morning spoke of Jesus' resurrection as he should. And so this evening, I want to talk about our resurrection. However, before we examine the resurrection, we must first speak further about the phenomenon of death. You see, death is this thing that we, we ignore until it happens to somebody who is close to us. And then it becomes so real, so life-changing, so powerful that it has the ability to change us for better or uh, for worse. Some people dig deeper into their delusions when death comes near. Others are transformed. Others' eyes are, are open to the reality of not only this life, but that perhaps there may be some other life. Perhaps they want to hope that there is another life aside from this one. It is when death strikes close to home 
that you begin to have a real sense of time, that you have just so much time and not more. When someone close to you dies, you realize that they spoke, that they breathed, that they laughed, that they built buildings, that they produced children. And now they're just laying there in the coffin. How many times do people, do you hear this at a funeral? I just spoke to him on Wednesday. We called and talked about you know, our gardens or something. You know, we, we just, I just saw him yesterday. How many times do we hear people say things like that? Mankind has always struggled with the reality of death and dealt with it in different ways. For example, Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, would have a slave whisper in his ear every morning, you are going to die. <laughs> Just so that he would keep everything into perspective. Can you imagine that you would wake up every morning and that your alarm clock would say this to you? Could you imagine uh, programming your alarm clock with say a voice chip? Every morning it would say, it's eight o'clock. Remember, today you may die. <laughs> I mean, what a way to start the day. Philip, however, felt that it was important to know this preeminent fact as he began each and every day so that he could keep everything in perspective each and every day day. Now, there are many superstitions, many ideas, many ceremonies and philosophies to help people deal with the reality and the pain of death. Paul, the apostle, sums up the non-believers' feelings about death in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, when he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. He's referring to people who have died so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. As far as Paul was concerned, the pagans, the non-believers, when it came to death, no matter what their philosophies, no matter what their concepts about death, the only thing they had was a sense of hopelessness when it came to death. In those days, like today, when it came to death, unbelievers had no hope. They had no knowledge. All they knew was that everyone was subject to death and no one ever conquered death. And the only thing that one could do when death came was to grieve over this hopeless situation. That's all they had, nothing else. This was the condition of men until Jesus Christ. Until Jesus Christ, this was the condition of all men when it came to facing death. But Jesus changed our attitude towards death once and forever. Jesus Christ dealt with death in a way that no one had dealt with death before or since. He was the first person and it was the first time in history that anyone claimed openly to have the power over death. In the beginning of Matthew, Chapter 28, we read the story of Jesus' resurrection, but at the end of the chapter, we note that Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Think about that for a second. He says, all authority, including authority over death. The first time in history of mankind that someone claimed to have power over death. In John chapter 12, verses 18 to 22, we see that for the first time ever, someone foretold of his own death and subsequent bodily resurrection and then accomplished it before witnesses. No one had ever done this before. No one had claimed to have power over death and then actually died and resurrected before witnesses. But Jesus did. In these, uh, in these verses, uh, it says the following. 
The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? He said to his disciples, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be buried. And then I will rise up again three days later. I remember Marty this morning, and I'm not sure if it was in the lesson or in the sermon, but he mentioned how many times Jesus had said this to his apostles. He foretold his own death, burial, and resurrection. No one had ever done such a thing in the past, and most significantly for us, it was the first time that such a leader promised to his disciples a similar resurrection from the dead. You know, religious leaders, they promise all kinds of things, but this is the only leader that promised his disciples that they would also experience a resurrection from the dead. In John uh, chapter six, it says, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but I raise it up on the last day. It is this resurrection that I wish to focus on briefly this evening. It is not the resurrection only of Jesus, but it is the resurrection to which his resurrection points. Your resurrection, my resurrection. That is the resurrection that I'm interested in and the resurrection that I want to comment on this evening. You see, Paul talks about the resurrection of Jesus and the subsequent resurrection of believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them there. And we'll begin the lesson on our personal resurrection from the dead from this passage. Now, let me give you a little background on what's happening in Corinth and the reasons why Paul is going to be talking about the resurrection of believers here. Among other problems in Corinth, it seems that some people were maintaining Greek ideas about the immortality of the soul. That after death, the soul escaped from the body to be absorbed into the great divine or to continue this kind of shadowy existence in the underworld. This was, this was Greek thinking. This was uh, 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 the idea of immortality as far as the Greeks were concerned. For them, physical resurrection or conscious resurrection from the dead was impossible. This is why they scoffed at Paul when he was in Athens and, and, and he was there to speak to them about God. And while he spoke to them, you know, when he spoke to them about an all, almighty God, they, they listened. And when he described the Almighty as a God who created the world, they listened. Even when he warned them that men were responsible to God in judgment, they still listened. However, the moment he said, and men will be resurrected from the dead, then they scoffed at him, saying that this was impossible and dismissed him from their presence. Greeks did not believe in the possibility of bodily resurrection. Therefore, many Greeks who had become Christians continued to reject the possibility of resurrection and were circulating these ideas throughout the church in that region. And so Paul, in response to these doubters, teaches about the specific and certain eventuality of total bodily resurrection in his first letter to the Corinthians in uh, chapter 15. And so beginning in verse one, he says the following. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then uh, to, the, uh, to the twelve. 
After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. In this passage, Paul reestablishes the fact that Jesus Christ did, in fact, rise from the dead. And this event was witnessed by not just one, but many hundreds of people to certify and confirm that the resurrection of Jesus was not just some imaginary thing. It, it wasn't just a vision or a hallucination that people were having, but it was a, a historical fact that could be confirmed by people who still were alive at the time that Paul was writing this letter. Don't forget, he's writing to these Corinthians saying that the people who witnessed the resurrection are still alive. You can talk to them and you can ask them and they will confirm that they saw what they saw and many of them died because of their particular witness. Paul also reaffirms that the resurrection of Jesus is the basis for the gospel which he and other apostles preached. And it was the rock upon which the salvation of these particular people depended. He says, Jesus rose from the dead, yes, and your faith is based on that very fact. And so he begins at the beginning, which is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ the historical event upon which their faith and our faith today rests. Now, he goes on to talk about the subject of resurrection, but not of Jesus' resurrection. His teaching now turns towards the resurrection of the believers. And this is what I want to focus on in the, in the remainder of my lesson. First of all, he talks to the doubters because there were some in the church who were doubting. He talks to them in verses 12 to 19, and he begins by dealing with the logical conclusion that comes from doubting the resurrection of Jesus. And so we read beginning in verse 12. He says, now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. He goes on to say, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. So Paul says several things uh, to the doubters. He says, if you doubt that Christ was raised, several things happen. If the resurrection from the dead is impossible, then even Jesus Christ is not raised. He also says, if Christ is not raised, then their preaching is worthless because that is the core of their preaching, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If, if, if Christ isn't raised, then your faith, he says, is for nothing because that is what you hope for. You hope for resurrection. And if there is no resurrection, what are you hoping for? And if Christ isn't raised, Paul says, we are liars because we have declared that God has raised him. And if this is so, the apostles are liars and the prophets are liars and every preacher that has ever lived until now, until the end of the world is a liar because this is what they preach. This is what we preach. They say Christ was raised from the dead. He says, if there is no resurrection, 
you are still guilty of sin and you are condemned. You know why? It is because if Christ is not raised, it means that he was a sinner and his sins have kept him in the grave. Now the only reason that Christ was raised from the dead is that he had no sin. Sin could not keep him and therefore he broke free of condemnation and was raised from the dead. Now, if Christ is not raised, it means that Christ was a sinner. That means that his sacrifice on the cross on your behalf is no good. It means you're still in your sins and you're all condemned if Jesus is not raised. If Christ is not raised, Paul says, neither will we. And so we have no hope, just like the pagans have no hope. And then finally, Paul says, if Christ is still in the grave, then Christians are to be pitied because their entire lives, their entire hopes are based on this one thing. Therefore, if Christ is not raised from the dead, Christians are living in a delusion. Denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ has da uh, disastrous consequences for believers. If Christ is not raised, then none of us can be raised and our religion and our faith is foolish and worthless. This is what Paul is saying here to them. And that's what I'm saying to you here tonight. If we doubt for a moment the resurrection of Christ, we are subject to all the things that I've just spoken of. We, we, we have a hopeless, worthless, foolish religion, and we are fools, the biggest fools in this world, if Christ is not raised. Well, after dealing with the doubters, Paul goes on to talk of the consequences for those who do believe in the resurrection. And he reveals the truth about what to expect from, for those who believe. In verse 20 of chapter 15, he says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. So he reaffirms the truth of the gospel. He reaffirms the fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. This has been confirmed by over 500 witnesses, he says. It's not like Lazarus' death or Jairus' daughter's death. These were brought back to human life after dying in order to face death once more. That was their lot. Jesus' resurrection is not like the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus died. Jesus brought him back from the dead, but Lazarus had to die once again. Paul says Jesus was resurrected from the dead never to die again. His is a glorious resurrection. You ever notice that when Lazarus came out of the tomb, his body didn't shine. There was no shining going on there. He was just, he was, he was dead. Now he was alive, humanly alive, but he wasn't gloriously alive. The resurrection of Jesus was a glorious resurrection. In addition to this, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of many other resurrections. It's the first fruit, the first harvest, and so his is the very first of many more to come. It is the image. It is the first in line of many, many resurrection. It is the demonstration that God can do this. We can be sure of our own resurrection because we have seen God resurrect Jesus Christ. And very simply, if he could do it for Jesus, he can do it for you and for me as well. Do you know how many times I hear people say, I can do this, I got this. You know, every people say, no, don't worry, I got this. Well, this is God's demonstration that he can do this thing that we hope for and that we pray for and that we desire with all of our heart and with all of our souls. And then in verse 21 to 28, Paul explains how Jesus accomplishes this resurrection and the procedure that it'll follow. Verse 21, it says, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, 
so also in Christ all will be made alive. So this is how it happens. First of all, there is death and then there is life. Notice the parallelism here. He says, first of all, there is death that comes through Adam and all of those who follow Adam in his nature. The first that comes is death. The first thing we know about is death. Sin comes and then death comes. And then he says, after sin and death comes life again through Jesus Christ and all of those who share in the nature of Jesus Christ. And so death comes through Adam and sin, and then life comes through Jesus Christ and faith. That's the procedure, he says. And then in verses 23 to 28, he gives us the procedure of the resurrection. Things are going to happen with the resurrection. It begins in verse 23 when he says, but each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits. And so the first thing that is going to happen in your resurrection is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the first thing that happened. That had to happen in order to make possible all the other things that are going to happen. Then in verse 23b, he says, after that, those who are in Christ's at his coming. The next resurrection to happen is the resurrection of the believers at the return of Jesus Christ. And so first there is sin, then there is death, then there is Jesus Christ and faith, then there is the resurrection of Jesus, and then there is the resurrection of all of those who believe in Jesus Christ. And so now the next passage describes three things that happen simultaneously at the resurrection of those who believe in Jesus Christ. First thing that is going to happen in verses 24 and 25, and that is the destruction of the wicked. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. There is the resurrection of Christ, there is the resurrection of the believers, and while there is the resurrection of the believers, there will be the destruction of those who are wicked. You know, when he talks about he's abolished all rule, authority, and power, he's not talking about good authority, good rule, good power. No, he's talking about wickedness. He's talking about the power of Satan. He's talking about those things that are going to be uh, uh, abolished. In verses 25 and 26, he says, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is, is death. Death will be abolished. Everyone will be resurrected. No one will ever die again. And then finally in verses 27 and 28, he explains that the third thing that happens at the resurrection of the believers is the reintegration of God and man. Let me read it for you. Verse 27, he says, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all in all. Now this is a difficult passage, but the key, uh, but you need to key in on the last part to understand. It says that God may be all in all. That is the third thing that is going to happen when the believers are resurrected. The wicked are going to be destroyed. Death is going to be destroyed and God and man will be reunited once again. You see, each person in the Godhead throughout history, of the history of mankind that is, has had a relationship with man. Uh, God the Father established the plan of salvation and God the Son worked out the plan of salvation and fulfilled it. And God the Holy Spirit strengthened the church to remain faithful to the plan of salvation. When Jesus comes again and the believers are resurrected, 
the Godhead will no longer interface with man based on these things. Why? Because salvation and the resurrection will have been completed and God will face man as one and man will be reunited to God once again as he was in the garden. So at the resurrection, none in the Godhead will need to execute a special ministry toward mankind. All will be united in the Godhead. So Paul says that when believers are resurrected, the wicked will be destroyed, death will be destroyed, and God and man will be reintegrated into a perfect union, a union that they had once before. So let me summarize what is taking place and what Paul is uh, saying here. First of all, Paul silences the doubters by reestablishing the fact that Jesus experienced the bodily resurrected and, resurrected and this was witnessed by hundreds of people, some of which were still alive and could give their witness uh, to those in those days. Secondly, he explains that this most uh, this is a most significant fact in the Christian faith because our hope for forgiveness and our hope for resurrection and eternal life is based on this, the resurrection of Jesus. Without the resurrection of Jesus, Christianity is foolish, it's worthless. And then thirdly, he begins to explain the process of our own resurrection. Death comes through sin. The first resurrection comes through Christ. And then at our resurrection, wickedness will be done away with. Death will be done away with. And man and God will be reunited perfectly once again for all eternity. And so in conclusion, I want us to note two very important ideas. First of all, Jesus Christ rose from the grave as he said he would. This means that all he has said previously has been validated. The one who conquers death can be believed. He can be trusted. He can be obeyed. As a matter of fact, the one who conquers death must be believed, must be trusted, must be obeyed, because there is no other position that we can have. And then secondly, those who believe in Jesus will be resurrected just as he was. This is what Paul is saying here. The reason for his resurrection was to accomplish our resurrection. And so every time you take the Lord's Supper, remember you are celebrating his resurrection, but you are also looking forward to your own resurrection. And so these facts lead us to several conclusions. If this be true, if Christ is risen from the dead and because of that, you and I will also be raised up from the dead. If this is true, then three other things are true. First, no resurrection, no gospel. In other words, any teaching or any suggestion that Jesus did not die or was not physically raised from the dead is heresy and it should be treated as heresy. And elders and leaders in the church need to be on their guard. No resurrection, no gospel. I remember when I first went to work at Oklahoma Christian University and before I signed my contract, I had to have a meeting with uh, Dr. North, Stafford North. We remember him, of course, he just recently passed away. And he says, I have some questions for you. Okay. I'd filled out the form and you know, gone to see the director and pretty much was hired in my mind. But then they said, no, you're going to have to go see Stafford North. And at the time he was the executive vice president of the, of the university. And I said, okay. So we sat there in his office and he says, I just have some questions just to tie it up, just to tie up our, you know, your meeting and your hiring process. I said, okay. Thought he was going to talk about money or something, you know. <laughs> so his first question was, do you believe in God? I said, yes, I do. 
Do you believe that the Bible is God's word, his inerrant word? Yes, I do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Yes, I do. I mean, it went on like this, go ahead. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was bodily raised from the dead? Yes, I do. Do you, do you believe that the Bible, maybe I mentioned that one already, is the iner inherent word, uh, uh, word of God? Anyways, he went on like this for 20 questions. He apologized at the end. He says, I wasn't doubting you. I wasn't accusing you of being some kind of heretic, but I just wanted to be sure. Because once you're hired, you're hired. Once you begin working for us, I want to be sure that the people working for us are people who believe these things. I don't know if they still do that, but that's what they were doing when Dr. North was there. I think a very good idea. And so basically, no resurrection, no gospel. Secondly, no resurrection, no hope. The central hope of our Christian life is our resurrection. I would encourage you, let us not jeopardize our resurrection with foolishness and worldliness and carelessness. Let us not jeopardize our resurrection uh, with disbelief and laziness. I would say to you, saints, be on your guard. Don't throw away this most precious thing for a moment of sin, for a moment of foolishness here in this world. We have this precious gift that is awaiting us at any time. Please guard it with your life. And then the third truth, no baptism, no resurrection. No baptism, no resurrection. You see, the only way to resurrect with Jesus Christ is to be baptized with Christ. You cannot resurrect with Christ unless you die with Christ in the waters of baptism. Romans chapter six, verses three to five. Don't fudge when it comes to this. Don't, don't, don't use a workaround not to be embarrassed. No baptism, no resurrection. Jesus Christ himself was baptized. Let's remember that. And so we need to heed the warning that we must not put off until tomorrow the assurance of resurrection and eternal life that we could have today. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, only those who belong to Jesus will also raise from the dead. And the only way to belong to Jesus is to die with him in the waters of baptism. And so we sing a song this evening in order to encourage everyone either to rejoice in what is about to happen to you and I when Jesus comes, or to respond to the invitation to come and secure your own resurrection by being buried with Christ in baptism. Whatever your reason for singing this song, please let us stand and do so with the confidence and joy of those who are destined for eternal life with God in heaven, because we will experience the likeness of his resurrection. Let us never doubt that, not for a moment. If you need to respond to the invitation uh, to confess Christ, to be baptized, well, we encourage you to do that this night as well. Shall we stand and sing the uh, song of encouragement?